Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Episode number 111 of the Sports Spectrum Podcast with three-time World Series champion Jeremy Affeld is brought to you in part by Compassion International. We're so excited to be partnering with Compassion. They do such a great job being a Christ-centered, church-based ministry that serves and ministers and saving kids from poverty and providing a hope and a future for them in Jesus name. 1.8 million people have come to be released from poverty because of Compassion International. Go to compassion.com slash sports spectrum. Sponsor a child today. It's $38 and will be the best $38 you spend every single month. You provide education food, medical care, vocational training, all done in the name of Christ. Go to Compassion.com. Sponsor a child today. Give a child hope in Jesus' name. Compassion.com backslash sports spectrum. Today's guest on the podcast, three-time World Series champion Jeremy Affeld joins us. And Jeremy came up in the major leagues in 2002 with the Kansas City Royals. Of course, many people know him for his time with the San Francisco Giants, three World Series championships, both in 2010, 2012, and of course, the most memorable one, in my opinion, 2014, where Jeremy pitched in Game 7 against the Kansas City Royals, the team that drafted him, and won the game. He went two and a third scoreless innings, won that game, was the bridge to get to Madison Bumgarner, who led the Giants through and the Giants won a dramatic Game 7 in Kansas City, and the San Francisco Giants were your World Series champions. Jeremy Affel got the win in that game, and we definitely talked to him in this podcast about that moment. He's got a great story. Really, this whole podcast is full of great stories. One of my favorite podcasts we've ever done, just because I didn't have to ask a ton of questions. Jeremy just has such a knack and a wonderful way of communicating uh, of sharing stories with a passion, but going deeper and taking you deeper than just surface level on what he was thinking, what he was going through. And he, you feel like you're in the moment with him when you listen to the different stories that he tells, including his major league debut, including the time his wife kicked him out of the house with his marriage kind of not working so well, um, including the time that he came to faith in Christ and what that looked like when he made Jesus his own and then especially the time when he pitched in a Game 7 in the most pressure-packed game you could ever imagine as an athlete being in Game 7 of the World Series and winning uh, the, the World Championship. And, and Jeremy's not just you know, one of those guys that was a journeyman pitcher. Maybe if you look at his stats in the regular season, you know they aren't anything that just screams, wow, amazing, awesome, unbelievable Hall of Fame type pitcher. But he mentions this in the podcast. It's not about what you did in the regular season. It is about what you did in the postseason. And Jeremy may be the best left-handed pitcher in postseason history when you really look at, especially from a relief perspective, what he was able to do. He's pitched in 33 career games in the postseason, and his career ERA is 0 0.86. He's allowed three career earned runs in 33 games. That's dominant. I mean, that is dominant of all dominant that you can get in the postseason. And he, he finished his career with 22 consecutive scoreless postseason innings pitched. That's the longest streak by a left-handed pitcher and the second longest streak by a relief pitcher or any pitcher for that matter. And it's not too shabby to be second all time because the guy who's in front of him is the GOAT himself, Mariano Rivera from the New York Yankees, the great relief pitcher there. Uh, Jeremy's currently a broadcaster with the San Francisco Giants since retiring in 2015. He works with NBC CSN up there in San Francisco. He's also a community ambassador for the Giants. He's an author. He wrote a book in 2013 called To Stir a Movement. He also blogs and he's very active on social media. He writes some very poignant uh, columns and, and blogs on his site. So lots to talk about here. Let's get right to it. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. This is a fantastic interview because Jeremy Affel is a wonderful storyteller. Enjoy this podcast. Three-time World Series champion, Jeremy Affel. Take a listen. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you. 
Looking forward to hanging out with you. It's good to talk to you. Excited to, to di- dive deeper into your journey a little bit, both from the faith perspective and from a baseball perspective. And let's start, because we'll talk baseball plenty here in this podcast, but let's start with uh, with your faith and growing up. Spokane, Washington, I believe, and where sports and sort of eventually faith played a role for you in this maturation process growing up when you were younger. Yeah, you know, uh, I was being a military kid, uh, I grew up kind of all over the world. Uh, well, more in uh, probably the South Pacific. And we just kind of played baseball on the bases. My dad was in the Air Force. Uh, we were, uh, I played t-ball growing up and then we went to Guam and then we, we, we played a lot of baseball in Guam on the military base. And I just remember the moms always hating it because it was red dirt out there. And so your uniforms would be white to red to just being red the rest of the year. You know, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting place to play baseball, but I just kind of grew up playing it. I grew up playing all kinds of sports, but baseball was just something I, I, I enjoyed doing uh, just naturally. And then just kind of moving around different places. I got to play in different pa- talent pools because there were different types of players in every city that we, we ended up living in. And uh, But then when my dad retired, uh, he moved us back to Washington State where we had been early in our early in his Air Force career. Um, because he loved it there so much. He bought land. We went to high school and I just kind of was one of those kids that, you know, I, 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 baseball came very natural to me, uh, pitching wise. I just threw hard and it wasn't anything that I learned. I never went to a baseball camp. I met my dad, my mom and dad didn't send me to those things. You know, I, I just kind of just played and all of a sudden I just started throwing hard in high school and, um, started gaining some identity from it though. You know, I, I really had a, a, you know, hard time trans when you transfer to a high school and it was a small private school, when you transfer to something like that and all the kids have kind of been growing up together at this private school. And then you come in the new kid on the block, they're not always well received. And it was a Christian school, but you, you didn't, it's high school, you know? So Christian high schools are going to have the same issues with, you know, Christian teenagers and non-Christian teenagers all are going through the same identity crisis and clicks and, learning to figure out what, you know, how, how, how to be somebody, who am I, all, all that stuff. And uh, I had a hard time breaking in and no one really let me in. And I was really becoming a loner until baseball season, my freshman year started. And all of a sudden it was like, I threw hard and um, I was uh, the starting pitcher for our district game. And we beat a big team in districts. I threw a, uh, you know, a complete game as a freshman and got us to state. And it just kind of went nuts from there. And I gained some identity just from becoming somebody through sports. And I, 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 unfortunately I did lose my way um, a little bit in high school because it became where identity was sports, not Jesus. And I just didn't, I was in that conflict of trying to understand faith, is this the God that I believe in or is this the God that my parents forced me to go to church on Sunday twice and on youth group on Wednesdays, you know? Oh And and it just became that for me. I didn't understand it, but my identity was sports. So then I started acting like a jock. I started, you know, getting really getting in some trouble as a basketball player. I get technical fouls. And, and I remember uh, my basketball coach coming up to me one day and just saying, you got one more technical foul. And if, if, if you get one, you're off my team. And I had to slot, I had to stop. I had to, I went and saw my uh, counselor who was also the assistant basketball coach, Jim Moore. And, and he walked me through the Bible, but he walked me through in a way that he's like, let's really, let's make this reality for you. Let's make this, this relationship with Jesus real and understand what it's the calling is. And I just had a heart change my junior year. Uh, my wife, who my present, my, my wife of, of 19 years uh, at that time had stood up in class. She's my high school sweetheart. But at that time, in, in, as a junior, she she yelled at me one day and said, I'll never marry somebody like you. And I, I was like, I'm really not thinking about marriage, so I don't really care. Right. You know? You're a dude. But, you're just like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, believe it or not, three years later, I was married to that woman. So, wow. uh, uh, you know, and in. And it, it, but I had a heart change. I actually understood relationship a little bit better. Uh, and, and sport was not, it wasn't identity, but it was more of, I, I started to understand that being humble as an athlete has nothing to do with going out there with your tail tucked between your legs and acting like you're not very good, which I think a lot of Christian athletes don't really understand what it means to be humble. So they actually 
deter themselves in their sports careers by trying to downplay their ability. Hmm. And, and I really understood and came to understand that my humility is not the fact that I'm not good. I actually need to know that I'm good. And I want to think that I'm the best, but that comes from the fact that God has given me that ability, not on my own. And so my identity started to change and I started to understand that a little bit more. And, and I, I got drafted out of my high school. I got drafted out of my, after my senior year by the Royals and I went to play pro ball. And it's kind of how my, my career started. Walk me through being a minor leaguer at such a young age and going through that world of professional baseball and just growing up and yet also trying to be faithful to who Christ was being married. Obviously you got married three years later. So you were young when you got married as well. Walk me through that process and that time frame. Very difficult. I, you know, I had a really, my father-in-law, my parents are very strong Christians. So, you know, my dad, being military, he would share a lot of problems that he had. Like he would, he would, you know, I wanted to quit several times in baseball just because I wasn't succeeding. I was a young kid that was real raw and I didn't have all that, you know, baseball camp refined talent that a lot of kids have coming in to pro ball or even the college kids coming in, right. That, that refined talent. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I failed a lot and I didn't fail a lot in, in my high school year because my high school years, we were such a small school that we, we, we beat everybody, but I threw so hard that these little schools never have never even seen that before. So then you get into pro ball where you're playing against the, the Latin kids that have been facing hard throwers their whole life. And you got college kids and who've been facing hard throwers and their swings are even better and more refined. And they competed at a higher level. And some of these high school kids have played in these amazing baseball programs out of Texas and Arizona and Florida. They've been seeing hard... So now all of a sudden I was getting hit around and I never, I, I've never even been hit hardly before. And I had to learn to fail and I had to learn what failure meant and failure was just teachable moments. And that, that was a very difficult thing for me to learn. So it got to a point where I was getting frustrated, at everything, I, 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 but it drove me so much towards, okay, I have to remember, I can't do this on my own. I need something to believe in other than myself because I'm failing myself constantly and I, and I don't like it and I'm not good enough to do this on my own. I'm not. And, and, and some guys who aren't believers, they get to the big leagues, not even believing in God, literally doing it on their own. I, I didn't have that kind of talent. I, I was not blessed. I, I felt like it was almost like God gave me just enough to where I could be talented enough to play pro sports, but it, he gave me enough thorns in my side that would drive me to his grace, you know, and, 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 and that was sufficient. And, and that verse came so much. So it became so clear to me on when you're reading about the thorn in the side and my grace is sufficient. You're like, there's so many thorns in my side trying to make it that I'm driven to try to understand scripture, try to, I was reading my Bible more than I ever had because I was just trying to understand who I was and who God was to me during that time. And I'm coming from a Christian school of 500 people, K through 12. Um, I was lived on a military base my whole life until I went to high school. Then it was pretty much, I lived at church and I lived at my school. My parents went to church and went, so there was always Christians around. And I had, we had some issues with our class, you know, my senior year, we had different, we had a normal issues with, you know, you, you, the, the, the girls getting pregnant and having to leave the school because the Christian school, you know, thing. And, yeah. and, and, but I never was around a ton of, of worldly chaos. Like when I went to play pro ball for the first time and then it was sex, drugs and rock and roll, man. And it, it was like, I had no idea what it was going to be like. I mean, the kids that are in the baseball teams, you know, when you go to pro ball, they, they don't know what you're doing on your off time. Right. They, they can't control a lot of every of all that stuff. They, they you know, that you're 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 expected to work at a job. But, man, they you know, you're sitting at these underage, these, these kids that are drinking underage, but they're offering you beer and you got to figure out, I, I don't know if I want that or not. Or hmm. or is that going to fit in? So I was battling all that. And 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 the, you, you have roommates who, you know, who are deaf, don't show the same morals that you have. So you're walking in and they have girls in their rooms. So you have to leave. I mean, there's so much of that that I was not at all prepared for. Like, I, I didn't know what, I was almost scared. And, and I really had to decide which way I was going to go. And, and now this is no longer the, 
uh, we had Sundays off in rookie ball. So I had to decide whether I wanted to go to church and spend some time uh, just really just understanding my faith and allowing God to mold me into who he wanted me to be. Or did I only go to church because my parents made me go? So I had to make a real definitive choice on, no, my faith is my faith, and I'm going to learn my faith because I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, or I'm going to walk away from it because my faith was only based on the fact that I was in my family's home, and they told me I had to go to church on Sunday. And and being inundated with so much of the world and so much stuff that I was not prepared for to be around, um, it, it, it was a, it, it spiritually beat me up, man. I was exhausted, but it drove me to scripture. And I re- I remember just, I would hide in scripture almost, almost in an unhealthy way, almost in a way that it became religion and law and legalism and mm. full of like, I have to read my chapter today or I'm not going to do good at the field type mentality. Right. Yeah. And it was a tough thing for me, but in, but in other ways, it, it helped me. It helped me to understand who God was. And we, we, I went on my, my faith journey, my personal faith journey, and my roller coaster ride with Jesus has started from the time I was in rookie ball. Well, I'm going to ask you about the day you get called up to the majors in a moment, but I'm just going to mm-hmm. kind of fast forward and then rewind, I guess. So I'm going to fast forward to your time in the majors and wondering, piggybacking off of what you just said, if it got easier or if it got harder living out your faith and sort of staying faithful based upon getting to the major leagues where it's a different ball game than the minors, as far as everything, not just your, your play on the field and teams and all that, but just the temptations and the money and everything, the fame and the accolades, all that, did it get easier or did it get harder as you started to get older and get your time into the major leagues? You know, I'd like to say it got easier because I had a foundation uh, of who I was. And I was always a pretty strong guy in my faith getting to the major leagues. And I had a, a good friend of mine uh, who was quite a bit older than me, but he was on the team my rookie year. And I'm still good friends with him to, to this day. Uh, he, he said to me at the end of the year, he said, Jeremy, I, I, you're, you're 10 years younger than me. And I look up to you. And wow. I said, why is that? And he said, because no matter what we did throughout the year, you never – crossed your lines where you said okay i will do i'll go out and have dinner with you we'll have a good time but when it comes to this moral stand i will take it and i don't go past it no matter how much I made fun of you tried to talk you into it anything you never crossed it and he goes that takes a lot of guts to do that at a major league level as a rookie where you feel like you almost have to do stuff if veterans were telling you to do it you know like we came up in that era where the veterans ran the gig and, and, and you just kept your mouth shut and did what you were told. And you know what? I, he said, you never back down no matter what we did. And, and he goes, I appreciate that, that you, you mean a lot to me. And, you, and, and I'm definitely have a high respect for you. And so I, you know, I would say that that was uh, something that I always was about. And I, and I, I was always someone that believed in my faith and was vocal about my faith. Uh, I was a guy that uh, tried to, to understand everybody. I was not a soapbox Christian. I was never a guy that would stand on my soapbox and throw John three sixteen or, 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 or start reading the scripture out loud or in my locker. It went, you know, about sexual morality. So guys would be for, you know, I was never like that. Right. Like I would be, I would rather go out with a guy and buy him a beer and talk with him about Jesus because it put his guard down. And I remember a guy coming up to me and be like, you can't drink. And I said, well, Okay. <laughs> What, 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 what makes you think that? He's like, well, you're a Christian. And I said, I realize some Christians think that way, and they can, and they have a right to. Some have that Holy Spirit enabling where it's like, hey, they don't, God's like saying it would not be a good idea for you. I do not have that feeling. And, and, and I said, there would be Christians that would disagree with me, and that's totally fine, but I have no problem having a beer. And I said, but do you believe in the scriptures? And he said, no, I don't believe in the Bible. I was like, well, then you really can't use the Bible against me if you don't believe in the Bible. That's so right. why don't we, so, so I, I tossed him a beer and I said, Hey, so why don't we just talk about what you believe in? I tell you what, we had the greatest conversation I've ever had. And that, that guy for the rest of the time I was a teammate with him, he would always listen and he would be listening on stuff. He'd come to dinner with us. He, he, he kind of look, he'd listen. And it wasn't until a couple years later that he called me and he said, Hey, I just want to let you know that, uh, I, 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 I'm leaning towards 
the faith. I haven't really committed yet, but mm-hmm. it's because of what you did to me that day where you just kind of let me be me and didn't try to change me. And you just, you just kind of loved me from where, for where I was at and didn't judge me or condemn me for anything that you didn't think was right. And you kind of were like that as a teammate. And I valued that. I valued that ability to say, okay, I have morals and I have convictions, but unless you can sit there and tell me that you're in the same camp as me, I have no right to tell you what you can and can't do. Cause scripturally it says, why wouldn't you do those things? If you live in the flesh, if you live in the flesh, why wouldn't you do all these things right. for me to come at you and tell me that you're going to go to hell if you do it? I don't know one person that's ever said, you know what? I can't wait to accept Christ because you're right. You telling me I'm going to go to hell for doing this stuff. I'm, I cannot wait to be a part of that family. You know, like no one does that. So I tried to just use my faith as an example. This is how I live. This is how I am. And my joy is real. It's not fake. It's not alcohol driven. It's not drugs driven. It's not money driven where I've got to buy tons of things in order to be happy. That's not where my joy comes from. Uh, and, and I did really well at that, but it got to a point, the fame thing, uh, affected, uh, affected me. And I didn't know it did on a subconscious level in 2013, my wife had kicked me out of the house and I had my new book was coming out called the Sura movement. And I was excited. And we had just gotten into this really, we, we've been having a little bit of problems in the off season, like a lot of athletes do in their marriages because they're around each other more than in the season yeah. and the friction just got too much. And she threw me out of the house in, in, in 2013 in spring training. And uh, it scared me because I, for the first time she actually, I threatened to leave her a lot in our marriage because it was like, you know, what are you going to do without me? You know, like, and all right. of a sudden and my wife's a very strong woman. So she let me know real quick. She's good without me. And she packed my luggage for me and threw me out and locked the door, you know? And, and it was because I, I was, I lost my way. I didn't know how to be a dad. I had three little boys. One was a newborn. And I, I would come home and feel so unappreciated. Uh, and, and it was because you go to the field every day and everybody's calling your name, asking for an autograph. Uh, you have baseball team uh, front office guys asking your opinion on certain things. You have players coming up asking for advice, marriage advice that I was giving where obviously my marriage wasn't that great. She threw me out, you know, and, and, and all these things, but then I come home and it would just be, it wouldn't be, honey, i so excited to see you. It would, it, it almost was almost like I go home and I wasn't famous in my own home and, and I'm used to being famous, mm. you know? So subconsciously you, 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 your identity got lost again. And I didn't understand how to be a husband and a father to a family that didn't care at all what I did for a living. And in a way you're, you're thinking you want that. But you don't know how to act because you got to switch hats, and it's hard to do. And that was an eye opener for me. And so, what I changed had, for you, Jeremy? What changed there? You know, when I got thrown out, I met a group called True Face out of uh, Phoenix, and they wrote a book called The Cure and Bose Cafe. And I read Bose Cafe first because Brian Hummel from the Arizona Diamondbacks, the chaplain of the Diamondbacks, he's yeah. at U- he runs UPI. I called him and told him I'd been thrown out, and he he had said I didn't even know you 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 were in trouble. And I said, well, I'm really good at making everything look good. Hmm. So, and he's like, man, he's like, all right, I got you. I'm going to have this group called true face call you. We had them at the men's retreat. You did, you weren't at the men's retreat this year, but they were phenomenal. And they eventually called me and said, we need to meet a long story short. They just, they said, let's meet. And, and I met with Bill Thrall, who's about a 70 year old man. And at first I was like, what is this guy going to be able to tell me about, you know, he's old, yeah. you know, this man was the most genuine, grace-filled man, and he, my wife loves him, and this guy didn't go into, well, here's the five steps to getting back into the bedroom, like a lot of counselors will give you. Yeah. It, it was like, no, Jeremy, let's get to the root of why you, why you are sinning so bad in your marriage, and my sin was verbal abuse. I would verbally abuse my wife. I'd make her feel guilty. I would, you know, I, I was just a harsh person in my home, which is weird because I wasn't like that at the field, and... And, uh, he finally said, let's figure out what your shame is. That's causing you to act like this. And man, he, he took me through this journey of grace and what it means to live with your wife and relationships in grace and your kids in grace and what it means to, to, you know, evaluate what your shame is and how you react from your shame and how God took that from us. And we went through scriptures and I see scripture in ways I've never seen it before in my life. And this guy changed our lives. I mean, he saved our marriage 
my wife throwing me out saved our marriage because I got to meet these guys. I now speak for them. I now travel with them. I, the next book I'm writing is actually has to do about shame and it's my story. It is that story of, of, of what I walk through and, and how I see life differently now. And, um, it's an amazing experience, but it was like one where it's like, man, you think you get the big leagues. I had a foundation of the Bible. I knew scripture by heart. I, I could throw scripture at you. Part of the reason I got in trouble is I probably used scripture on my wife when I can, I think every man out there would probably tell you and probably be honest. Like if you drop scripture on your wife and you're arguing, it is the worst possible thing you can do. I would agree. You know? Yes, sir. <laughs> so, I mean, you think, Oh, I'm going to, yeah, the Bible says this and man, it ain't going to go over well, you know? So I had to figure that out, but I had to cover it up because with baseball players, we wear a lot of masks and because we can't show that we're scared or insecure when most of us are. We do not want to fail in front of 50,000 people, yet we will fail in front of 50,000 people in millions over a TV. And then social media is burying us, and people are telling us all this stuff. And a lot of guys don't even – they want to use their social media as a marketing aspect, but they don't want to look at the comments of their agents because it affects them. Yeah. And, 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 and there's so many masks that we wear where we got to say we're too tough for that, and, and nothing affects me. And there's the sun comes up the next day, and you got to have a short memory and, and all these things. and. And then you go home and then you're, you're frustrated with life and you take it on your family. But if someone comes over, you can put a smile and a burger on the grill and act like life is great. You know, like we can do that very, very well. And yet it kills our relationships and affects our family and people around us. And it affects you and eventually killed me. It eventually put me in a spot where I didn't, I was drowning and, and I couldn't even hear God because I could tell God, like my wife is an issue and these are the things she does wrong. And I thought I was so right. So my prayers were, God, change that woman because she's nuts, you know? And <laughs> and the whole time, God's like, man, this is going to go bad for you, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. And I couldn't hear it, you know? But God, but God's grace said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you thrown out of your house, but it's the only way I can get you to meet these guys that can get you to see what grace is like and what I died for, you know? Not just for fire insurance, not just so that you can go to heaven, but I died to take away shame and that you can live in relationships with the grace that I've given you. And you will know what that looks like to be a new creature in Christ Jesus, because now you are different and you will live different because of it. And I, I just, I, so it changed me and I learned a lot and I had a great journey in, in baseball and it taught me a lot of things and there was a lot of pain, but there was a lot of my journey that made me who I am today. And, and the only way to do it is go through those pains. We'll have more of our conversation with Jeremy Affeld in just a moment. But want to talk to you really quick about Compassion International. $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. Over 150,000 children chose to follow Jesus Christ in the last year alone because of Compassion. And because of people like you, one sponsor at a time for $38 a month. And your money, that $38, goes right directly to this child and providing them food, providing them vocational training, education, tutoring, medical care, all in the name of Jesus, $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com backslash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Now back to our conversation with three-time World Series champion Jeremy Affeld. We're talking to Jeremy Affeld here, the former Major League Baseball pitcher, three-time World Series champion on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Jeremy, I want to ask you a little bit on the field, two moments in your career, and they're kind of bookends. One is uh, April 6, 2002, in your Major League debut, and then I want to talk about Game 7 with the Giants in 2014. So let's start with that first game, April 6, 2002, five years basically after you were drafted by the Royals, and you get your call, you get your shot to go to the show and pitch in the big leagues. What do you remember about that day? What comes to mind about that day? Oh, man, a lot of things. You know, I, I made the team out of spring training. I just didn't pitch for a couple of days. But I remember when they told me I made the team, I, I started crying. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I threw well in spring training. I, first, my wife actually got on me because the first person I called was my dad, not her. She didn't know, you know. But I called my dad, and I remember telling him, I said, Dad. And he answered the phone. And I remember he answered the phone. I said, Dad. He said, yeah. He said, I said, I did it. He said, what do you mean you did it? I said, I just, I, they just told me I'm on the, the major league team. I just broke camp on the big leagues. And there was complete silence hmm. for about five seconds. 
And all of a sudden, my dad, and he's a military. This man does not cry. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he just started crying. And he could not. He's like, Jeremy, you don't understand. Like, watching my son achieve a dream is the probably single greatest thing that could ever happen to me. Because it's an, I know how hard you've worked. And you're actually telling me that you made it. And you're telling me all those games we went to in your high school and junior high and flew all over the minor leagues to watch you play and and, and he, he is you're in the big leagues i said yeah and he i remember he started crying and i made me cry you know so i'm yeah. out there crying and then i called my wife and my wife was like oh that's nice and i was like <laughs> what that's nice like what are you talking about i made the major but she was back home packing for thought we were going to triple a so she had flown back to washington so she actually she just couldn't when I said she, she, she said, I was so shocked. I, I didn't know what to say. And I did, then I was like thinking, wait a minute. So we're not going to Omaha. Now we got to Kansas City. Now I have to pack. I have to change. So she said, you don't understand how many things are in my head at one time when you say that. So she's like, all I could say was that's nice. And she goes, yeah, it was so much more to that, but it was so shocking, you know? And so when I made the team, I remember flying on the big league plane. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. And then you get into the game and you're watching. The very first game I watched was we were against the White Sox, obviously. And in and, and the first game, Frank Thomas had broke his bat and hit a homer. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, I have no shot at pitching in the big leagues. Like, they're breaking their bats and hitting homers. Like, you have got – and this, uh, you know, Big Hurt, he's a massive individual. Yeah. You know, like, he's so big. And so I go up. So when I get called to go into this game, it was a couple games into it. First guy I face is, um, um, oh man, I'm brain farting. I used to, I, I would ever, I would, I would always tell myself I would never forget this player because he's the first guy I faced, and I've just <laughs> forgot. It's okay. Uh, he, oh, Kenny Lofton. First guy I faced, Kenny Lofton, lefty. I strike him out in three pitches, and it was like, oh, I, I did it. Like I got him out in the big leagues. Like, like now it counts, right? Like. I might get released tomorrow or I might get sent out and never come back. But I recorded now at the major league level and it was against a really good player. You know, it was Kenny Lofton. Right. So, uh, and then I remember when Frank Thomas came up and it was just like, this is what Goliath looks like. You know, like it, you just like, I'm facing Frank Thomas. I watched this guy as a kid. Like, so everything was an awe moment for me because I'm facing every guy that I watched as a young kid and mm -hmm. I'm 22. So I'm not like I'm 27 years old getting to the big leagues. I'm still young, five years out of high school, you know? So it's not like, and, and I remember jamming him and he, he got a knock off me, but it was a jam shot over second, you know? And I was like, all right. And then I went on from there, but I remember getting through my inning. I think I went one or two innings that day and I was in the gym working out. I felt so good, you know, like I just felt, I don't know. It, it, it's like, this is happening. Like I'm in the big leagues, you know, like it, this, this really happened. I, 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 I competed on some of the best fields ever. I faced a really good team in the white Sox. guys have always grown up watching. I got guys out. I'm like, this is, this is amazing to me, you know? And, and it was, it, it was a surreal experience. There's so much more, obviously, in your journey, and our time is limited. So I want to fast forward to 2014. And now knowing what you were going through personally with your marriage and some of the things you just described earlier, it's interesting to think where your mindset was 2014 with that San Francisco Giants team that you end up pitching with. You had already won two World Series there in 2010 and 2012. And here you are in Game 7, 2014. And you pitch two and a third scoreless innings of relief. You allow just one hit and you earn the win in the Giants 3-2 Game 7 victory. Many people will remember that as Madison Baumgartner's game where he comes in on two yeah. days rest and just shuts down the Royals on or in Kansas City on the road. There's so much there. That's one of the most memorable games I can remember of recent memory watching. And I yeah. recently went back, and I know I'm talking a little bit, but bear with me. I recently went back to watch a post-game interview of you with Ken Rosenthal from Fox after the game. And I don't know if you've gone back and watched this since, but you were very emotional. You were talking about having your kids there to witness that moment, beating the team you began your career with. I just want to go to that day, that moment, everything that transpired. Take us through that. Walk us through getting prepared, knowing if you're going to pitch a game seven, actually pitching that game, and then everything that took place after it. I mean, that's the pinnacle moment, right? Yeah, that... People say, well, isn't 10 your favorite moment because that was your first World Series win? 
uh, where you have first ring. It's not. And, and here's why, because exactly what you said, you know, coming up with Kansas City, making the big leagues out of Kansas, Kansas City, and then within four and a half years of being in the big leagues with them, I hated the game of baseball mm. because I failed all the time. We lost 100 games a year, almost every year. Uh, I, was a, I was a starter, a reliever, a closer, a setup man. I was getting hurt. I, all, you know, I had blister problems. I, I, there was just so much frustration there. And I remember how Matt, and much I hated being a part of that organization at the time, even though they gave me a shot. And I have a high respect for him. But at the time, I was emotionally connected to a part of like, I just don't like being here. I don't want to go to the field ever because these guys, we were just not very good. I'm not very good. I've had issues with the coaching staff. Uh, we've had a bunch of different coaches. I had one pitching coach that went behind my back and did some stuff that wasn't right. I mean, you had so many, so many things that were just bad yeah. about that situation. When I got traded, I was so excited to get out of there. But in a way, leaving that stadium when I got traded, feeling like I needed a new start because I wanted to quit, but I couldn't quit because I, I'm not being a quitter is not in me. But I needed to either get released or traded. So if I got released, I didn't do it. The team told me I wasn't good enough. I was good. I was done. Or I get traded and have a fresh start because I feel like a loser on that, in that stadium every time I go there. To now, I'm in the World Series in that same stadium, <laughs> pitching in that, on that same mound, staying downtown and visiting some of our friends that were in Kansas City when we played there. Everything was so normal. And then – Going in and you're in game seven of 2014 and, and you pitch an amazing you – know, I, I was a bridge to Madison uh, to get them to, to win that game. And what they did – when they came down, I assumed Madison Bumgarner won the game. They gave him a win because he pitched the fifth, right? And he pitched five innings. Right. I mean, it's like, okay. And they gave him the win. And then the Elias Sports Bureau had called up. And they actually overrode the scorekeepers. And the scorekeepers, well, we have the re the rules say to go, no, the rules are the game-changing moment. And there is no doubt statistically that the changing moment came in when Jeremy came in and killed a rally. And he pitched enough innings to be able to get the ball the, and to take the go-ahead run while he was pitching. Yeah. So they changed it. They come down. And my wife had come into the locker room. And we were so pumped. And we, we, when we went on the field, I, the reason I was crying on the field is because every boy that was born, we have three children. All three of my boys, boys were born in World Series years. My oldest son was born on the, in, in, uh, at the end of August and we went to the World Series of Colorado and lost to Boston in four. My, my middle son, uh, Logan, was born in 2010 in September, went to the World Series, beat Texas. Colt, my youngest son, was born in August 28th, the same exact day as my oldest son. They both have the same birthday and, and we went and we beat the Detroit Tigers. So that one right there and my sons, I said, you each get a ring from your world series years. And I, it was such an, I know it's going to seem to a lot of people like this is bad. Like, cause no one even hardly, no one wins one ring. Most people don't win one ring. Right. right. Yeah. But my son, my oldest son has a loser ring. It is a national league championship ring, which means you lost the world series. So everybody calls it the loser ring, right? If you have an American league championship ring or a national league championship ring, it's just cause you lost. Yeah. Like you didn't win. Right. So, so I'm like, when we won, I just remember saying, that's my son's ring. Like that's now all three of my boys will be like, I, I don't wear those rings to be a champion. Right. I, I don't want my kids to identify with those rings, but I want them to all have a champion because in my heart, it's like, this is who I see. You are champions. You will have a ring because you may never play pro sports, but this signifies this family lineage of like being champions. And we want to be champions in life, not on the field. And so I was so excited to get that third ring. It just, it, it made me weep because I was like, my son gets one too. He, did, he doesn't have to feel like he doesn't get one, you know? And, and then when my wife comes into the locker room, she's hugging me and her, she knows the experience we had in Kansas City and the frustrating times that we had there. And then all of a sudden, we were just sitting there talking, and, and she hugged me for so long because she understood. I told her going in, like, it's really weird to be playing in a world championship in Kaufman and being an ex-royal, right? And and knowing that I played with them when they were really bad. Yeah. And, 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 and right when I said that to her, they walked up to me and they said, Jeremy, uh, we want to take your stuff to the Hall of Fame. And my wife and I go, what? And they go, well, you, you know, you, you, you set a record for the most scoreless appearances by a left-handed pitcher. 
Actually, overall, you're second. You just passed Bab- you just passed P- Babe Ruth <laughs> as the most scorelings scoreless runs in a, in a playoff history. And the only one that had beat you is Mariano Rivera, and he's only got you by an inning. And I'm like, I didn't know any of that. Right. And I was like, what? And then they said, but then we also sending your stuff to the to the Hall of Fame because there's only there's not very many people that get a W for uh, a Game Seven World Series. There's just not a lot of them. And I look and I, I looked and I said, well, that's Madison. They said, no, they overrode it. You are now the winner of Game 7 2014. And my wife and I started crying because it was like, wow. if that's not a kiss from heaven in the circle of life, of getting called up with Kansas City to hating playing baseball, to begging God to please either let me be no longer playing the game or give me a ride that is going to open doors to be a better witness for him, to them leading me to Colorado, to Cincinnati, to San Francisco, to the end of my career, full circle, back on the state, same stadium I felt that, like a loser from, to win a world championship, and not only that, to be considered the winner of Game 7. My wife and I, we lost it, because that's like as good of a circle of life of baseball as God can give you. Yeah. You know, like there's... And, 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 and so we, I literally broke down. Like I dropped to my knees, and my wife just hugged me, and we cried for five minutes. I mean, some of the players were looking at me like... Like, dude, like, it's exciting you can cry, but this is a little much, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, but they don't understand the emotion and the spiritual journey and the frustration that I had gone through. And I played 14 years in the major leagues, and there was not re- – I think one year, 2009, was my best year ever. And I won setup man of the year, had a 180 ERA. It seemed every game I pitch in, I came through, and it was my easiest year ever. I mean, it's like I could do no wrong the entire year, and I dominated. But that would probably be the only year I had in 14 years where I felt like this was fun and easy. Hmm. Every other year was just frustrating, ups and downs, good times, bad times, frustrating times. Like it's a struggle. It's like it was so hard of a career for me. I didn't make all star teams. I didn't, you know, I didn't have that. I'm a 300 hitter. I'm a 20 game winner. I got six all star teams. I didn't have the easy street in the big leagues. And I just said, man, this is what it means to persevere. And, and there are trials and temptations for other people that will look a lot worse and maybe are a lot worse. But for me, I went through so many trials and, and, and frustrating times where I had to lean on God and really have faith. And my faith was tested time and time again, to be able to walk off like that. It was like, I'm going to finish out my contract in 2015 and I'm done because that's, this can't get any better and I can't do anything else. that's going to make it any better. And and I got to respect where I'm at. And, what, what an amazing kiss from heaven, that's for sure. And then you said 2015 was your final season, Jeremy, and I watched the YouTube clip again. I, I went back and watched a bunch here as we prepared for our interview in that final game against the Rockies and just the ovation that the fans gave. Such a cool thing to to kind of go off on a high note. And I also know that while you were, I think you, while you were still pitching, you've been doing this for a while, you, you turned to writing. You wrote your book in 2013, as you mentioned earlier, and your blog, jeremyaffelt.wordpress.com, and you still write that blog today. So I'm just curious, tell, take us through why you decided to to use this blog as a place to, to, to share and to encourage and to write. Uh, and many of the topics you've written about, you know, are pretty deep ones uh, about faith. So take us to about writing and, and how that's been for you. Yeah, you know, I got a lot of stuff. I, I love public speaking. It's a passion of mine. Uh, and I got a lot of stuff in my head. And I have a lot of ways I can communicate it. And I really like communicating through story because there's so many things that baseball gave me. And in through all these ups and downs, there's so many stories, whether it be of success or failure, that I can share and, and, and relate to different topics on life. And, and I just I learned so much as a believer in baseball and, and trying not to be this believer that turned everybody off, but actually made everybody feel comfortable to be around. And... And I, I, I just remember when I started doing some stuff with human trafficking and learning about that when I was because I have a nonprofit called Generation Alive mm-hmm. and we do a lot of stuff in poverty with young people. And I remember the reason one of the reasons why I started it was because I I'd start I helped help with a hunger initiative from a group called the Youth Front out in Kansas City. And my buddy Mike King uh, runs it and I helped do this hunger initiative with them. And I like the curriculum so much. We started, we do that generation alive. Now we've done over 3 million meals in the last four years with kids and helping out hunger initiatives. And then, so as I was looking at all this stuff on hunger in the world, and then I started looking at water crisis and thinking, what is going on all this water? So I started putting in wells 
uh, in Africa and just really seeing how much power a freshwater well can give a community of people to then seeing where all this poverty was, you saw human trafficking. And, yeah. and I just was like, what? I, was just, I thought slaves were done. I thought that was a civil war. You know, I was as ignorant as anybody else, you know, like it was like, I thought that was done way back then. And you start seeing how much of it's going on. I remember starting to get together with people in San Francisco and understanding what, what, it, what it was all about. And, and then I just started writing. And I remember uh, uh, I started doing a lot of articles. And a woman called me, Beth Davies, out of Denver. And she said, you know what? I, I'm, a, I'm a professor of writing. And I'm doing, I'm doing an article. And I just need to understand because she goes, I'm doing a lot of stuff in human trafficking. And your name keeps popping up on all these different human trafficking scenarios because you're a baseball player that's trying to bring awareness to it. And that's not heard of. Mm. And she says, how does a baseball player and human trafficking issues, how do they mesh? Like, how, how is there a symmetry there? How, what, what, what is it about you? So I started talking to her. And at the end of the interview, she said, you know, you need to blog. And I'm like, ma'am, I don't have a lot of time to blog. <laughs> like, everybody thinks baseball players have all this free time on the road. But half the time that I use my free time to mentally decompress you know yeah. so yeah. so i said i don't have a lot of time and she's like well what if i wrote it you just recorded it and i said i can do that so she said i live in denver so when you play the rockies let's meet every once once one time every series that you're here and we'll record a couple hours worth of conversation and then i'll just transcribe it and you approve it and we'll post it and so i started using a ghostwriter for my blogs and she's very good and i just I can get it all out. I can say it. And I'm very good at, at speaking it, at communicating it. I'm very good. I'm not good at organizing writing. I just am not. And yeah. so with, when it comes to my books and my blogs, I use ghostwriters. And I've told ghostwriters, these are my words, not yours. So don't change them. Like I will approve everything you, 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 you write. I just don't have time to type it on a paper. I got three little boys. I mean, I don't have time. So I use them and, and they've done a great job. And, but it, the reason why I do it is because I believe one of the tattoos on my left, I have a tattoo on my left forearm that says no man shall live for himself. And that came from a, uh, I, I read a book um, about 24 seven prayer called the vision and the vow written by Peter Gregg out of England. And it's the best, one of the best books I've ever written. It, it basically locked in my spiritual journey. I mean, I have, I have a lot of tattoos and a lot of tattoos come from, reading this book and some of the spiritual journey I'm on, and it tells my story. And in that book, he wrote about a man named Count Zinzendorf out of Germany. And uh, there's a town in Germany called Hernhut. And, a bunch, and, it was, and, and it was founded by a bunch of Moravians, which are kind of almost like gypsy Christians. Mm -hmm. And Count Zinzendorf, told, had, obviously as a count, had a ton of land. And he went to an all-boys school. And there was a there was a group of boys that got together and they, they called themselves the order of the mustard seed. And obviously the mustard seed is, is, is biblical and faith like a mustard seed. Right. Yep, so uh, they called the order of the mustard seed. And there was like there I think in that group, I think the founder of the Salvation Army might have been one of them. There's a general. There's a king. There was like several guys that had some influence. Uh, spiritual influences and not only that worldly influence, but spiritual influence and on their ring. They, they wrote in Latin. They all had to wear a ring to be a part of the Order of the Mustard Seed. And in the inside part of the ring in Latin, it said, no man shall live for himself. And under those three, stip there's three stipulations under that, under that uh, motto. And it, in order to not live for yourself, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the third one was take the gospel into the world using the platform that you were given. So whatever that is. And Count Zinzendorf had all this land and he found a bunch of Moravians living on it. And he let them live on it. And, and, the, and these Moravians for 100 years had a room set up that they would pray a live prayer. Like each person would take an hour or two hours in the community. They'd sign up. So for 100 straight years, there was active prayer in this room. And they had so many miracles that happened there. If you looked at the story of Hearn Hunt, and it, it'll talk about amazing things that happened spiritually there. Uh, and, and a lot of movements came out of, out of Hearn Hut. And, and I said, you know what? That's exactly who I want to be. Hmm. I want to be a part of that order because I want to not live for myself. And I want to, I love Lord God with all my heart, soul, and mind. I desire to love my neighbor as myself. 
and I want to use the gospel and, 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 and preach the gospel and, and, and give the gospel in a way that my platform allows me to have it. And I was given this platform as a major league baseball player and I get to get speak and public speak now. And a lot of circles that I get to go into do not happen unless I was a world champion. They just don't. That's how the world works. I mean, the, the doors that have been opened to me yep. is, is because of what I did on that field and God can open them however he wants to open them. But I think in his sovereignty, Hey, you know, like Joe Blow doesn't get to go into like this amazing corporation and talk about leadership. Like God opened that door and he used the door to be open. How he opened it was he gave me a platform to do what I did on that field in the playoffs. I wasn't anybody super great in the regular season. I was an average. I mean, I had some good years, but it wasn't like I was a super uh, sub one mid one ERA guy as a reliever. It's the playoffs that I did so well. And people only remember what you do in the playoffs. If you're a playoff pitcher, you can have, I mean, there's another believer. He's a Christian. I, I, uh, he's a great guy, but Kershaw, he's unbelievable in the season. He's the best pitcher I've ever seen. In the playoffs, it, it's a black mark against that guy. It's frustrating for him because yeah. he's really good. And God has given him some amazing platforms. And his platform is, yeah, he has so many doors because he's a Cy Young Award winner. God gave him a platform and doors open because of what winning Cy Youngs and being the best left-handed starter in baseball during the regular season. For me, that wasn't the case. Mine was... They remember what you did in the playoffs when you won a championship. And I was an impact on all those teams. And, and for me, I, 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 I take that platform and I run with it. And that's why I blog and that's why I write and, and I speak. And, and that platform, pretty soon I'm hoping that my platform is just because of the kind of speaking that I do and the quality of speaking that I do do for people and not so much as a baseball player. But the initial platform to get me in, that's what I'm using. And yeah. it's part of that order of that not living for myself. And your career postseason ERA, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's like 0. 0.8 something. 0. 0.86, 0. Yeah. 0.86, three career earned runs and 33 games pitched. Not too bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's finish it with – go ahead, go ahead. Everybody, I'm sorry. Everybody asked me, he's like, what did you do different? I said, nothing. I threw the ball over the white plate. It just had to end up going to everybody all the time. <laughs> like, it's not like I came up with some supernatural pitch. I right. said, I'm telling you, that's a God thing, man. That's a thing where he says – I remember walking in and some people will think I'm, I'm not trying to be spiritually kooky. I'm not, I'm not a spiritually kooky guy, but this right. happened. I remember walking in game four of Detroit and I came into that game and I had to strike out Prince Fielder, uh, Miggy Cabrera and young, all three of them with a guy on first base and to, to, to get through, I ended up striking, striking out the side and it was like going through Babe Ruth three times. Right. <laughs> so I, I remember that and it was a game and it, we won game four. But I, but, I, but I went up to my wife right after and I said, I'm going to tell it to you now because I don't want it to, people to think that I'm, I'm telling you right now because it's so live to me. I said, I was so comfortable out there and I had a sprained UCL joint in my thumb. I couldn't even, I couldn't feel, I was on a painkiller to numb up my thumb so I could spin a curveball. Hmm. Like I did not, ha- I was hurt bad in my thumb. And, 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 and I, I said, God, I, I'm going to need some help. I mean, it's cold. My thumb is stiff. I'm, it's killing me. It's throbbing. I can't, I mean, it hurts to throw every pitch. And I said, but you know why I felt good? I told my wife, I said, I promise you this happened and it's never happened to me before. I ran through the gate. I ran through the gate in Detroit. And I, when I hit the center field grass, I literally felt like I heard God say, and that wasn't a voice. It's not like it was not the road to Damascus. It's not like he blinded me into the but I, my soul, I'm telling you, I heard this loud and clear, and it gave my, me so much peace. God said this. He says, tonight, I expand your territory, and I, ex- I extend your platform. And I had no idea what that meant. Wow. I'm like, what? So I ran in, right? I'm like, I don't know why I just thought that, but this is really weird that I'm thinking I'm talking to God, and I got to go pitch against these three dudes in game <laughs> four, right? Like, I'm like, yeah. I probably should be thinking about how I'm supposed to pitch. I'm not. Did I just hear that from heaven? Like, it was the weirdest thing. Like, I'm running in thinking there's no way I just heard that. But the second we did that, we won. The doors for me speaking flew open, and it's true. It's real. I, and, and I'm not saying that as, like, trying to make something up. That really happened. Like, he said, tonight I, I, I expand your platform, and it happened. And, and I think that's God. That's what he's doing. He's saying, if you do what I've given you talent-wise and you glorify me with it, that I can't sing worth a lick. My only form of worship is to play baseball and to pitch great when I'm on that mound. That's my sacrificial worship out there. And, and, and I b- truly believe that if you, 
you you use that and you utilize your talent to where God says, I've given you this talent, work hard and, and know that you are reflecting me when you're out there. And I was not always the per- I didn't always have the best language when I pitched. I'm competing. So sometimes my mom would call me and she'd be like, I saw what you said out there. Yeah, mom, <laughs> I kind of said a bad word. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm competing. Right. Like, so yeah. I'm not saying that it was all perfect, but my heart was. I want to reflect who God says I am out here on this mountain. I'm a fierce competitor and things happen when you compete. And I competed fiercely and I wanted to win and I hated losing. And, and, but I knew that one, once it was over and I put my other pants on, man, I wanted to love people like Jesus loved people. And I failed obviously earlier in the conversation, talked about how I was thrown out of my house, but my wife will tell you that, that once I got a wake up call, man, I wanted to love my wife and I still want to love my wife and my children like Christ loves the church. And, and I, that was a reflection I wanted to have on everybody when I played. And I think he's honoring me and, and, he, and he's saying, man, this is the kiss of heaven that you get when you just live in me. It's not like I'm going to reward you for doing good things. You're going to be rewarded because you're living righteously and righteous people. The paths are so good. When you live a righteous life, it's not a reward. It's not like it's not like God's giving you candy for doing something good. He's saying if you live a righteous life and your heart is righteous and pure and you're living for me, think there's going to be bad things that are going to happen because of that, but there's also you're going to feel heaven when you live that way. And I think that's what I'm doing. I'm feeling heaven. I'm feeling what it means to to for heaven to kiss you and to celebrate when people are at, with heaven celebrating you and your life and not always easy, not always good, but in the end, you, you see where it's the only path you want to take, you know? Absolutely. Let's finish it with this, Jeremy. Obviously, you're now retired, three years from retirement here in 2018. You're broadcasting games for the Giants. You're public speaking. You're doing such great work there. Community ambassador with the San Francisco Giants as well. Encourage our audience with scripture, maybe a scripture verse that's been um, on your heart lately, something that's been speaking to you. And uh, share that with myself and with our audience, those listening to the podcast. You know, I, there, there's so many different scenarios on that, uh, on, on things that, that I look at sometimes and I'm like, man, it, it, there, when it comes to scriptures, it, it's an interesting one for me because there's so many different ones. I mean, there's the one where basically that does say no man should live for himself. That, that's the scripture that has always been with me is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But love your neighbor as yourself because they're that they are one and the same, and people don't. And, and someone reflected that to me one time. You know, it, 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 in in the actual translation, it's saying you can't do one without the other. Don't claim to love the Lord your God with all heart, all your heart, soul, and mind, and not love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you don't love God because we are all made in the image of God. We're all made in that image. And we're not always going to do it perfect. It's not about every time love your neighbor. It's if you don't have a heart. To look at your neighbor and say, I need to love them as I would love myself, meaning I need to give them grace because I give myself grace. I, if someone's hungry, when I'm hungry, I eat. So I need to help someone eat. When I need to, when I need to eat someone to drink, I give them something to drink. You know, there's so many things we can do to serve our community and to show the love of God. And it's not about always going to church or having all these verses you know, in your home or, or carrying a Bible around simply just going around and, and knowing that when you're out in the community, you love your neighbor as yourself and you're a loving person, people will know who you are, you know? And, and I, I think for me, you know, one of the scriptures I just read the other day is Romans 14. And it took me a while to kind of understand it. And it's the first few verses. And it says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may, he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands and falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And if you think about what that's saying, it's like, man, don't look at the man who's weak and say you're not good enough. He's going to stand because not God's going to make him stand. Which means if you are, for me, if I'm living righteously and I'm living how God wants me to live, I'm not going to judge another man's motives by his faith and I don't need to be judged. I can tell you this, that no matter what happens, because I believe in Jesus, he will make me stand, which means he will uphold my righteousness and he will allow me 
to not fall. He's not going to allow me to fall flat on my face and lay there for the rest of my life. If I'm walking what I, how I need to walk and I'm loving Jesus and my heart is to love my neighbor, to love God, then he will force me to stand. He, he's not going to allow me to fall and lay there and, and, and he'll hold me up if he has to, but I'm going to stand and I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to be more than a conqueror. And I think that is so true uh, for, for all of us. And for me, when I'm feeling weak and I'm feeling like I'm not accomplishing something, I've got to remember that God, when it comes time for me to stand and accomplish it, he'll, 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 he'll pick me up and hold me if he has to, but I will accomplish it because of who I am in Jesus. And I need to know that that is my identity. It's great encouragement there. He is Jeremy Affel, former Major League Baseball pitcher, three-time World Series champion, doing great work with his ministry, Generation Alive. His book, To Stir a Movement, is out. It's been out for a few years. He's got another one coming out, and you can follow all that he is doing on Twitter at Jeremy Affel. Man, thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate your time and your your heart and your energy for and your passion for the Lord and just uh, wish you nothing but the best. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate the conversation. And we do thank Jeremy Affeld, three-time World Series champion, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed listening to this guy. I actually told him off the air after he was done taping with me. I said, you got to get your own podcast, man. I mean, this guy is is a wonderful storyteller, and the medium, the form that, of, of media that podcasting provides is really set up beautifully for what this guy has experienced and being able to share so many different uh, walks of life and the stories that he tells and the encouragement that he can provide and the, the love that he has for his family and the love that he has for God. I mean, it's just really awesome. And I hope to, to have a podcast or hear a podcast from Jeremy Affeld sometime in the future. But in the meantime, you can read his stuff, go to Jeremy com. So that's his blog site, Jeremy com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Jeremy Affelt and check out his his ministry, his nonprofit that he's got going on, Generation Alive, doing some great work combating human trafficking, providing clean water, feeding the hungry, just doing wonderful things, being the hands and feet of Jesus. That's what it's about, right? So Jeremy Affelt is doing just that, and we can't thank him enough for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. I'd love to get him back because I know there's tons of stories that we didn't get to that uh, I would love him, for him to share at another time. So maybe around the World Series or so, we can have him back on and, and share some more uh, stories of his time during his baseball career. But we thank Jeremy for joining us here on the podcast. And we thank you as well. And we certainly thank our sponsor, Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum for $38 a month. You can make a difference and sponsor a child and make a difference in their lives in Jesus' name. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, one child at a time. Compassion sponsors like you and me, because I sponsor a child, my daughter and my wife, along with myself, we sponsor a young 13-year-old boy from Haiti. You and I can help over 1.8 million children in 25 countries. That's what's been happening with Compassion International. And it's never larger than just one child at a time, one day at a time, one sponsor at a time. And that's where you come in. You can make a difference in a child's life, releasing them from poverty and giving them hope. That's really all that children should, should have to worry about. Just giving them a hope. If they know that there's hope, man, they can accomplish anything they want. And you can do that. You can make the difference. $38 a month. Go to compassion.com slash sports spectrum. Sponsor a child today in Jesus' name. I promise you will not regret it. Thanks so much for joining us here in the podcast. Go to sportspectrum.com. That's where all of our content is found. Of course, you can go to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, everywhere podcasts are found. And you can leave a review for us on Apple iTunes Podcasts. Go leave a review. Let us know what you think of Jeremy Affelt, what you think of the podcast. And email us, jason at sportspectrum.com. When you email me, it comes right to me. And I can take a look, and if you have any guest ideas, if you have any thoughts, what you thought of the podcast, what you thought about um, our sponsorships with Compassion, anything you want to email us on, email me, jason at sportspectrum.com, and we just appreciate your feedback. And, and listen, if you like this podcast, the, the best way that we can get the word out 
is from people like you listening and sharing it. So if you like what you heard, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, share it on Instagram, tag us. We would love to retweet you and uh, say thank you through social media and our platforms and just be grateful that you enjoyed what you heard and want to share it with others. So thank you so much. We appreciate you. We hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.